So the topic for discussion today is on odontogenic cyst. Now, before directly talking about the cyst as such, we'll see a brief introduction on the development of the tooth. Now, the development of the tooth will begin at the sixth week of intrauterine life with the proliferation of the dental lamina. Now, the dental lamina will proliferate focally and form the enamel organ. Now, this focal proliferation of the dental lamina will extend into the mesenchyme and form the enamel organ. The stages of the tooth development are dependent upon the shape of the enamel organ. So, it can be a butt stage, cap stage, early bell stage and advanced bell stage. In the bud stage, the enamel organ has an bud-like shape and the it will form an in epithelial mesenchymal interaction with the mesenchyme immediately surrounding it. This causes the condensation of the mesenchyme forming a dental papilla. Now, the remaining portion of the mesenchyme will form the dental follicle. Now, this mesenchymal condensation will trigger the selective proliferation of the enamel organ cradling the dental papilla, forming the cap stage. The next stage is the cap stage, where the enamel organ has a cap-like shape. Now, in this particular stage, the enamel organ has three layers, an inner enamel epithelium, a stellate reticulum and the outer enamel epithelium. Now, here what is actually happening is that there is accumulation of fluid or intercellular edema which actually separates the polygonal cells in the bud stage resulting in the cells being held together by means of their intercellular junction. This forms the star or the stellate shape stellate reticulum cells. The cells will start further differentiating and enter the next stage which is the early bell stage. Next stage is the early bell stage. Now in this particular stage there is differentiation of the inner enamel epithelium to the amyloblast and the dental papillary mesenchymal cells into the odontoblast. In addition to the, these layers of cells, there is going to be something called a stratum intermedium immediately above the amyloblast. Now, these cells are actually considered to contribute to the formation of enamel by giving the uh, needed alkaline phosphatase and other organic materials required for the formation of enamel to the amyloblast. Next, now, as uh, the enamel or dentin starts forming, the um, inner enamel epithelium or the um, amyloblast now and the whole enamel organ gets cut off from its main source of nutrition, which is the dental papilla. Now, what happens is the dental uh, lamina connection is lost and it forms a remnant of the dental lamina. Along with this, what happens is the enamel organ collapses so that the external dental follicle can be brought closer to the amyloblast to provide it with the nutrition that is needed. Following this, what happens is the root formation begins. Now, the ends of this uh, enamel organ will start contributing towards the formation of the Hertwig's epithelial root sheet which triggers the formation of the root. Now, once both the crown, uh, completed crown and a uh, two-third of the root is formed, the tooth starts erupting. Kramer, in the year 1974, gave the definition for cyst, which is a gold standard, which is still followed with certain modification. So, he actually defined a cyst as a pathological cavity having a fluid, semi-fluid or gaseous content which is not created by accumulation of pus. So, he made it clear that any cavity which is formed by pus is not a cyst. So, this was further modified to include that it may or may not be lined by epithelium. So, if a cyst is lined by an epithelium, it becomes a true cyst. Again, if it is not lined by an epithelium, then this forms the 
pseudocyst. Now the parts of a cyst can be three. So there will be a cystic lumen which will be surrounded by or covered by a cystic lining. Now the full thing will be encircled by a fibrous cystic connective tissue wall which gives it somewhat a proper integrity. Now this cystic lumen can either be empty or it may contain a fluid uh, or a semi-fluid material. The classification of these odontogenic lesions, um, a cyst or tumor, it is a dynamic one. It constantly keeps on changing. New entities are being added, some entities are being disregarded, some are being de reclassified. Now, in the year 2005, in the third edition of the WHO classification, the odontogenic cyst were not included in the classification at all. Now, broadly, you can divide the odontogenic cyst into developmental and inflammatory. Now, in the year 2005, the developmental cyst included dentigerous eruption, glandular odontogenic, the gingival cyst of adult as well as newborn, the lateral periodontal cyst as well as the botched odontogenic cyst. OKC and COC both were reclassified as odontogenic tumors due to various reasons. The inflammatory cysts were residual cyst, radicular cyst, inflammatory collateral cyst, paradental cyst and the buccal bifurcation cyst. Now, in 2017, the WHO gave its recent classification, that is the fourth edition of the classification. Now, in this classification, the odontogenic cysts are again added back in the classification. Now, they classified the odontogenic cyst again into a developmental cyst and the inflammatory cyst. Now, in addition to whatever was present in the 2005 classification, three changes were made. They reclassified OKC and COC as cysts. Now, OKC was classified as a tumor owing to its aggressive nature, its tendency to recur and because of the patch gene or the PTCH mutation. So, recent studies actually found that this PTCH mutation was seen only in 30% of non-syndromic OKCs and in all of the syndromic OKCs. So, syndromic OKCs belong to the nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome where there is germline mutation of patch gene. So, this patch gene concept they disregarded. The next one what they were saying was that when they did marsupialization, the lining in the margin, they reverted back to an almost normal or normal epithelial condition. This was contradicting Willis definition of a tumor wherein the tumor should continue in the same aggressive uncontrolled manner even after the removal of the stimuli which caused the change. Again, there were certain dermatological lesions resembling OKCs which was still considered as a cyst and not a tumor. So they concluded by saying that there are no evidences currently supporting the tumor nature of OKCs. So it is best to classify it as a cyst. Now coming to COC, the reason why it was put as a mixed tumor that is calcifying cystic odontogenic tumor was because of the monolistic constant where they said that it is actually a tumor which is showing cystic change. Now they actually embrace the dualistic concept wherein they told that there is a cystic component which is a COC and a solid component which they termed as the dentinogenic ghost cell tumor and put in the odontogenic tumor classification. Now coming to OOC or orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst, what happened here is that this was earlier considered as a histopathologic variant of OKC 
but studies have actually shown that this shows no recurrence it lacks all the characteristic features of okc and has no tendency for whatever of an aggressive nature so they told that it is a separate entity because it doesn't have to be treated with that much of an aggressiveness as an okc now inflammatory cysts many of the cysts that were mentioned before were removed and put together as a single terminology which is the inflammatory collateral cyst again radicular and residual cysts remain unchanged now there is another group of lesions called as the fissural cyst which is believed to form by the entrapment of epithelium during fusion of the bone now it is found that the fusion of the bone long happens before the epithelium is able to get entrapped and they disregarded the concept of fissural cyst but however one of the cysts that is a nasopalatine cyst still remains as a component of this odontogenic cyst merely because it is actually there and doesn't happen because of entrapment of the uh, epithelium but merely because of the retention of the remnants of the naso uh, epithelial lining in the nasolabial duct so i hope uh, i've done justice for this topic thank you and please subscribe to our channel and like this video so we can get more videos like this to you